Yes, as you, uh, as I'd like to uh, point out, please, every time you hear the word blockchain, take a shot. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mike Butcher. I'm the editor at large for TechCrunch. Um, what is Parity? Your turn. Parity is a company these days with about 40 people developing core blockchain technology and other decentralized technologies for the future web. What's its relationship to Web3? Um, it's two completely different entities. Web3 is a foundation that was started by Gavin earlier this year um, in order to, um, to develop out a protocol that we call Polkadot, which is a completely new blockchain um, that Parity will, um, will build. Thank you very much. Gavin, what's, po what's Polkadot? Um, Polkadot is a next generation blockchain technology. It's it, it, it's got a few goals in mind. So the, the initial goal was scalability, the ability to actually secure multiple chains uh, using um, a sort of single um, set of uh, validation and finalization apparatus. Um, but it's also really meant to be an experimental test bed for developing new kinds of blockchains. Um, and specifically the part of the blockchain that we call the state transition system, which is the bit that sort of determines what the blockchain does and how it works and what sort of transactions it can accept. What's, um, the, what's the sort of the real genuine problem you're trying to solve with Polkadot? It's, it's this sort of um, this halfway house or this uh, interchange mechanism between private blockchains and public blockchains, correct? Is that the, is that the problem it's trying to solve? That's certainly a, a large part of it. It's really a bit more abstract than that. It's really about providing a platform that can do a bunch more stuff that makes an awful lot more stuff easier. And one of those things that it does make easier indeed is the ability to mix private chains and public chains, get them all sort of operating together. So, um, so you're trying to get these things to work together. This is very early in the days. Um, I mean, I think what we, the context that we need to set this in really is, is, is it's almost like going back to 1994 or 1903 or, or even earlier, perhaps, in the development of this technology. You're not the only one, of course. There's also uh, Cosmos, uh, Aeon, Landon, Metronome, who are all other, uh, focused on other, you know, similar kinds of ideas to link public and private blockchains. Why do you think yours is better and why will it win? Um, I mean, there's certainly a general direction towards interoperability. I think people are starting to realize that there isn't going to be sort of one chain to rule them all. Um, and there's uh, sort of space in the world for lots of different sort of niche chains, be they private, public, yeah. different types of public chain. Um, the, the key thing about Polkadot is really um, the notion of, um, of co-securing the chains. So the idea that there's a single validator set um, which are uh, incentivized by a single token. And this validator set can actually secure an awful lot of chains um, without those chains nece necessarily having to provide their own um, incentivization mechanism, token, whatever, um, for their own uh, finality or validation. Is that, an, is that an advantage in terms of not needing, needing uh, kind of complex mining mechanisms or something? It, it basically gets rid of that whole notion of needing staking or mining or a token. Yeah. You, can, you can have a sort of absolutely secure chain um, without uh, the need to provide any of that bit of the blockchain that generally is, is the thing that's hardest to provide because it requires an economy of, uh, within right, the chain. Right, I see. So it's, it's super cutting edge stuff. It's absolutely amazing. Now, Ryan Zura, who's a partner in Polychain Capital, one of the private investors uh, in, um, uh, the, in Polkadot, um, said Polkadot's a crucial infrastructure element of Gavin Wood's vision for Web3 and represents the most technically ambitious endeavor we have ever seen in the blockchain. Realistically, only the deep and extraordinarily talented team from Parity, led by Jutta Steiner, have the technical shot chops to pull something like this off. Now, he said, this is your investor, he said you had the technical chops to pull it off, and yet when you wanted to raise money, you raised money with a token sale offering, and now some money's gone missing, or not missing, it's sort of dead in space. Do you want us walk, to walk us through that story? Because apparently, uh, one million Ether have become frozen in wallets, $280 million worth of digital currency, $90 million belongs to parity. Um, so it's dead in space. I think you raised something like $140 million overall in the token sale and the pre-sale. 
and yet this $90 million is frozen in space. Yuta, what's happened? It is indeed the case that the money is currently blocked. Um, so what's happened basically is a library um, that governs the logic of the wallets that people use um, had a bug, so which was due to um, refactoring, a delicate refactoring at a time when tools really weren't as developed. Um, it's really unfortunate because many groups, I mean, not just the Web3 Foundation, but also other groups um, were in the middle of their ICOs and had their ICO funds in the wallets. Um, but I think what's, what's important to, to see in contrast to other um, technologies or like conventional um, systems, the great thing is that in this case, we are in the situation where these funds can be unblocked in principle through a protocol upgrade. Um, and that's one thing we are working towards. I mean, really, it's, it's the symptom of the technology being at a really, really young state um, where we haven't figured out how to, how to deal with bugs um, in, a, in a general way, um, which will come, which developers will make, um, where the governance tools aren't yet there. But it, but wasn't as if the, it wasn't as if the bug wasn't noticed. Apparently, the risk was identified on GitHub in August, and it was misinterpreted by Parity, uh, but no action was taken. Why was no action taken? It was, um, there was a, an issue reported, but it was not reported as a um, critical security um, flaw. It, it was, was just put in the queue. It was, it was by this contributor just registered as like, it sounded like a nice to have um, upgrade to the contract, but not like a security, like Ni a critical security. Nice, nice to lose $90 million. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> but like, it's, it's really unfortunate. But it, it, as I said, like it points to, at the issue that, that, this, that this whole ecosystem hasn't developed yet, all the tools that are needed to safely deploy contracts. Um. So you said apparently there's no timeline to fix this, or is it? There is a timeline? Where are we in the timeline? So there, is, um, there are discussions that um, the issue could be fixed in a general protocol upgrade in the next scheduled hard fork, probably in the next four to, to six months. And, um, and how are you? Are you, are you? are you feeling upset that you've lost all this money, Gavin? Well, or are you, you, I, th I okay? think lost is probably not quite the right word no. there. Um, I apologize. But uh, there's, you can't access it at the moment. It, it's true. It's sort of uh, something of a long-term savings account for us right now. But um, it's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. It does demonstrate the early stage um, uh, and, and some of the uh, difficulties with authoring uh, software on the platform, given the uh, the tools that we have. Um, so, all yeah. in all, yeah. uh, it's you know it, 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 it's a it's a stark reminder that we are um, on a path, and uh, uh, things like Polkadot are really kind of necessary as uh, systems where we can actually experiment with doing new kinds of software development right. uh, practices on blockchain, such as you know, formal verification. Do you think that there's a, a fault in Ethereum itself here? Well, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a fault. It's like the early stage and things haven't been, haven't been developed. I mean, there are ideas around like, how such issues can be fixed in general. Like, people will make, make faults and, and bugs and build them yeah. into contracts. And, and that's what we are working towards to solve this in a Well, way. it sounds like um, um, you were accused of fraudulent behavior, but I pre presume you deny this. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, now, it's really what we're talking about here is moon landing stuff. You're really, it, this is it's 1969 and we're trying to land on the moon here. Um, but what do you think about, let's, let's move on to more um, yeah, sort of the bigger issues. Let's zoom back. You know, there's this huge early, early, uh, early technology, very, very difficult, still very nascent. Um, what are the, let's look, zoom out and look at the kind of the big picture. What do you think are the real advantages of decentralization that it's, and the way that it's talked about in this, in this space? Jutta. Um, I hope that over um, what we're going to see is actually a much more secure, secure web in, in the long term. Like, um, I mean, we all, I mean, who of you has had their data stolen or, um, or leaked at yeah, some point? Totally. So, I mean, this is really, this, these issues will become much bigger. And what we hope to build is basically the infrastructure for, for having a much safer um, decentralized web. Gavin. I think we're, you know, they say we're in the sort of post-truth um, uh, post world, right? 
uh, the, the Trump and Brexit, you know, the, the various sort of um, untruths, as they call them now, spread. Um, and I, I can kind of see that. I think we're, we're kind of more in the post-trust uh, trust world. So um, I think this ties in also to the banking crisis, where people are increasingly of the opinion that the, the people um, sort of high and mighty up there that are running, um, that are running the world are, uh, are perhaps not playing fair, or perhaps not being um, um, particularly honest or playing by the rules that they say they play by. And, um, and I think this is one of the reasons why Bitcoin actually sort of was, was, was a real zeitgeist yeah. in that you know, people felt, at least the technologically minded ones, but I think increasingly um, more sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of mainstream people are, are of the opinion that they don't need to trust the central bank or politicians um, or systems that are fairly obscure and, and, and opaque. They can actually use something that is more or less the same as the cash in their pocket or, or the notion of gold. And that, that I think, is, is, is part of the, um, the whole sort of notion of blockchain and crypto and what it's delivering. Decentralization is sort of a means of delivering it. But we're, um, forgive me for being devil's advocate, but you know, there are only a handful of people who are, who are really controlling these systems right now. The Vitalik Buterin, <laughs> you guys working on your project. That's not decentralization, is it? There's, there's only a handful of people working on these systems. It's, I mean, it, it, that's partly true and partly not. So it is true that there are relatively few people in this ecosystem, um, and many of those people probably exert a substantially greater degree of influence than yeah, he, you know, the, yeah. that one individual would, would suggest. But the, cr the really crucial thing is that they're open and transparent, which means anyone, if they educate themselves well enough, can join in. Right. And if they're able to contribute and convince other people that their contributions are worthwhile, then that allows them, their contributions, their influence to have a greater effect. Um, so really, it, it, it's not so much the current state, but rather the game that, that we've set up that people are allowed to play. Um, yeah. You two, we, I mean, you're a mathematician originally by trade, correct? Do you think um, we're moving to a world where, where maths become the new judiciary, become the new institution? I think we're seeing that, that it plays an, an even like more, more and more important role every year. I mean, um, what, what drew me into this space was like what, what Gavin said, like the fact that with maths, you can all of a sudden like solve this societal issue of like how, how, to, how, to, how to work out trust between people. Mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty fascinating. I mean, like maths is, is in the end the language with which you describe like all sorts of technical um, problems. Um, you, you, Gavin, you've got some very, uh, some big thoughts about the fact that um, U.S. companies, um, you know, in order to protect um, U.S. companies, you know, governments uh, or government institutions like the NSA in, 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 introduced encryption, mm -hmm. and now that's actually being turned against us. In the U.K., we've got a uh, Home Secretary who's uh, often going on about uh, breaking WhatsApp so that they can get to those ISIS groups. Uh, breaking encryption, shutting down Telegram. Mm. What do you think is going on here? It, it's it's a, an interesting change of, um, of philosophy almost. And yeah, absolutely right. In the 80s and 90s, it really was the job of the government to, um, to protect their own country's businesses from um, uh, data being stolen from uh, information espionage from other states. And what we're seeing increasingly in the last decade or two, especially when it's combined with things like you know, Snowden revelations, some of the stuff you know, WikiLeaks has been, um, has been publishing, we see an increasing, um, uh, almost like the gun is being turned away from other states onto portions of a country's own citizenry. And I think we're, we're almost moving into a state of sort of digital civil war here. We're seeing um, less of the, uh, of the sort of, ah, it's Chinese hackers that are the problem, and an increasing amount of, uh, oh, well, it's terrorists in our own country that are the problem. And so what we need to do is ensure that everybody's communications are it's insecure right. in order that uh, we can be sure that the citizens that we don't like, um, we can keep tabs on. And of course, what this means is this ties into further uh, sort of um, uh, things that we read about the news, like, for example, Hillary Clinton's emails being hacked. Why were they hacked? Well, because the information systems that she used were fairly insecure. Is banning encryption going to help that? Well, no, it's not going to help that. They're probably easier to hack by other state actors like the Russians or the Chinese. Um, well, what, what happens if, um, 
if uh, uh, the, Trump, the next Trump campaign is run on the blockchain, what then? Uh, we'll be able to see where his funds are coming from, at least, I suppose. <laughs> Good point. Um, you, um, you've been critic critics of the, um, to some extent, of the whole ICO phenomenon, and you know, wanted to effectively disassociate yourself from that. Um, do you think that there is a sort of a good side and a bad side in the sense that you know some kid in the in a back bedroom can you know do an ICO and raise some money for his uh, local school or something or uh, or you know where does it go from here? Yeah, it's um, I, definitely there are the darker and lighter sides of ICOs. Um, I think uh, I think it's pretty obvious um, if you look at these things. There's there's quite a lot of fairly dodgy. Uh, uh, sort of campaigns going on. But that said, we also have to remember that there's an awful lot of, um, you know, Ethereum, the thing that actually facilitated all these ICOs and therefore was reasonably successful, was itself something of an ICO back in the day. Um, so it's, it, we can't label them all as like good and bad, and for sure there's plenty in the gray area as well. But um, I, I, at the end of the day, it's a powerful technology and mm. it will be used by anyone for all sorts of ends. Do you, you're to, you know, you built, you've, you've been, Paris has been focusing on this, uh, this, uh, the wallet aspect, this very sort of complex um, multi, multi user wallet, multi. Multi sig wallet. Multi uh, signal wallet. Um, what's next for Parity? Where do you go from here? What other projects can you give us a, give us a preview of? So, I mean, like the wallet actually is just one project that we've been working on. I mean, the main thing we've been busy with was developing a client that's currently managing about 40 billion um, US dollars every day. I mean, it's the core client for the Ethereum network. And, um, and we are, we'll be focusing on like further improving this technology, working on the Polkadot project, um, bringing this to life in concert with the Web3 Foundation. And, and other decentral technologies um, for managing data in decentral ways. Is this, um, is it this uh, with the view to uh, disrupting the banking system or decentralizing bank the banking system, or is it something else? It's, it's with a view of like giving, like making the web again more, more democratic, like building actually this peer-to-peer -peer web that, we, that most people were thinking of when, when the web was initially built. Mm. Um, do you, uh, are you optimistic about, you know, where it goes? I am really optimistic. I mean, I'm, I'm always um, surprised by like how collaboratively, especially everyone in this space works together on improving things like in this open source, source manner. And, and this makes me really um, confident that, that this will go into the right direction. There are, there are other blockchain uh, blockchains appearing like NEO, for instance, in China. Do you think uh, Ethereum is here to stay or do you think that uh, that uh, around the corner there might be something better. I think in the end the best technology will win and and I mean we're gonna see who can who can pull this off But um, I'm really excited to, to just see this whole space growing That's a very diplomatic answer <laughs> um, Presumably if there are other competing Ethereum's and Neo's and, and other kinds of blockchains um, Polkadot could sit at the, in the middle of this and become maybe the most the real <laughs> Real, uh, the real deal, because if, if you control all the way these chains operate, surely then that makes you bigger than Ethereum, no? Yeah, I didn't say that, but I'm, I'm glad you did. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> you can put that on your advertising campaign. Thank you very much, Gavin Wood and Jutta Steiner. Thank, Thank you, you very much Thanks. for coming to Disrupt. Thank you, Thanks. darling. <laughs>